The next important thing is the in spinal cord injury neurological examination. And this is particularly important when you're trying to transmit a picture of how the patient is doing uh, to your uh, colleagues. And it also has a, a very important prognostic uh, element to it. So there's a, it used to be called the Frankel scale, then it became the Asia impairment scale. Now it's often referred to as the Inski. They're all very similar, but they basically divide injuries into five types. Those that are complete with no motor or sensory function below the level of injury. B is incomplete with complete loss of motor function, but sensory preservation, including again, examination of the perianal area to see if there's any um, preserved sacral function. That would be in B. A C is sensory incomplete and motor incomplete, but the motor function is less than three on five. D is uh, obviously a lesser form of injury, sensory incomplete, motor incomplete, but uh, the motor function is greater than four on five, and then E is normal. So that's the Asia impairment scale with regards to A, B, C, D, or E, but then there's also levels that you can define, and this is um, based on key uh, motor groups that you examine. And so if I'll give you an example, you can read the table here, but if somebody has um, no motor function uh, in their hands uh, and legs, but they have uh, deltoid biceps and wrist extension that is greater than three on five, then they would be Asia A C6. And then if they had wrist extension, but also had triceps uh, that was greater than three on five, they would be a C7. And so, and the difference between a C6 and a C7 level is enormous. A C6 would be able to uh, navigate a electric wheelchair, while a C7 could uh, navigate a self-powered wheelchair. So you can see just one level, one muscle group can make an enormous difference in mobility. There's another term, two terms that you need to be aware of. One of them is spinal shock and the other is neurogenic shock. Spinal shock refers to the motor sensory and reflex changes that happen early on after spinal cord injury. So for example, this is the easiest example and most, um, uh, impressive is that when a patient comes in with a serious spinal cord injury and you examine their reflexes, they're often areflexic. So that, you know, reflex hammer to the knee elicits no response. But if you see them in rehab three weeks later, um, they've recovered from the spinal reflex shock and they're hyperreflexic, have clonus, spasticity. So that's an example of the early phases of spinal cord injury where the neurological exam may not be uh, completely accurate. And it has to be distinguished from neurogenic shock, which is the cardiovascular effects of a spinal cord injury above T6. And essentially, you knock out the sympathetic system and you have parasympathetic overdrive. So you have decreased blood pressure, which is the shock part, but you also have a decreased heart rate as opposed to an increased heart rate where you might, uh, which might be seen in anemic shock, septic shock, cardiogenic shock. So if you see someone with no movement and uh, has a level above T6 and has hypotension, and um, a uh, bradycardia, that, that's, that's a manifestation of neurogenic shock. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.